Sir Gawain and the Green Knight Part 1 Long ago at the castle of Camelot in the court of King Arthur a great celebration was taking place. It was New Year's Eve the 31st of December and the knights of the round table were preparing for a feast. They danced and sang and drank until they were tired and sat down to rest. Arthur sat at the head of the table looking at his court with pride. Next to him sat his wife, Guinevere, who they say was the most beautiful in all the land. The queen spoke. I think it is time that I make us a rhyme. And warm these walls with a story. The knights cheered, Guinevere's stories were always full of laughter and adventure. But the queen smiled darkly. You laugh and you cheer. But instead you should fear. This story is not an adventure. I'll speak of the day. When I went away. And met deadly Morgan Le Fay. Suddenly the room fell silent. Morgan Le Fay was Arthur's sister, but her name was rarely spoken in the court of Camelot. She knew magic, the people said, and nobody had seen or heard of her for many years. Arthur placed a hand on his wife's arm, but she continued anyway. It was at Tintagel, that castle by the sea. That I met Arthur's sister, who I thought would be sweet. At that horrible place the two of them grew. Where the waves lick the walls like the hungriest wolves. And the wind hits your eyes so hard you could cry. Guinevere, said Arthur, I. After great Uther's death, their wonderful father. The brave knight Arthur left home to run after. His wonderful fate. To Camelot he went. But Morgan stayed home and cared for a grain. Their mother whose madness gained and gained. She thought she was helping, cared day and night. But her mother grew madder, a horrible sight. Arthur cleared his throat loudly, but Guinevere had had a lot to drink and there was no stopping her. So I wasn't the warmest when greeting Le Fay. But still I expected her kindly to say that I was her sister, deserving respect. But she stared in my eyes and said instead, So it's you, the mouse who married my brother. That great snake Arthur who left our mother. I couldn't believe she called Arthur a snake. I said, Arthur's the son of King Uther the Great. If such a great man could sire a snake, then his wife is the devil. My voice did not shake. The room was so quiet now that you could hear a mouse moving or a snake sliding across the floor. Guinevere had called a grain Arthur's own mother the devil. If only you knew, said Morgan Lou F. Dinner is ready. With great relief, the servants came in carrying dishes of chicken, potatoes, carrots, and all other kinds of delights. Everyone happily began eating, glad that Guinevere's story had been interrupted. She didn't seem to mind either as a huge piece of chicken was put in front of her. The only one who didn't eat was Arthur. This was not because he was embarrassed by his wife, however. Arthur was a chivalrous man and he forgave everyone for the occasional foolish remark. No, it was because the great king had a tradition. He waited until the tension in the room had left and everyone was celebrating again and then he stood up. My friends, my men, my Camelot knights. Have you forgotten the date of this night? I have a tradition which all of you know. Until it is done, my hunger will grow. I must hear a story, a tale of adventure. Before I'm allowed to put fork into trencher. So who'll tell the story, permit me to eat? Who'll tell a tale to sweeten my meat? The men started arguing over who should get to tell the tale. But before a winner could be decided, the doors to the great hall slammed open. A freezing cold wind blew. 
A man rode in on a horse, and everyone turned to see who it was. It was a horrible creature, a massive man riding a massive horse. His arms were as large as melons, his chest was like a wardrobe, his legs could have been planted in an ancient forest, and his face was meaner than any monster's, with a beard that poured from his chin like a waterfall. But what was most shocking was not his shape, but his color. Because the night was green, green all over, green like fresh leaves in spring. Every part of him, his skin, his hair, his clothes, even his horse, was green. The green knight spoke. I've come to the court of Arthur the king. I see you tell stories, eat supper and sing. I've heard of you heroes so holy and happy. I be sure of their chivalry, so say the songs. But I want to challenge this circle of swordsmen. So this is my deal. You could call it a contract. Come sign it, brave sirs, so we can decide. If the court of the king is where cowards hide, a man must come meet me, make himself known. I'll get down on the dirt and make my neck shown. You'll swing not a sword, but attack with my axe. Just once you can swing. Don't worry, I'll wait. In a year and a day you'll find your fate. You'll get on the ground and give me your neck. Because that is the deal, destroy and be dealt. A blow for a blow. Be brave and don't show. Any fear. For you follow the finest of kings. So I ask of you, Arthur, will you step in the ring? Everyone turned to Arthur. Slowly the king got up. I welcome you, friend, to sit at my court. I do not wish any wars to be fought. Here we are blessed and surrounded by peace. I ask you, friend, come join the feast. But if you insist, I'll agree to your game. Though I think it will end in your death and your pain. The Green Knight laughed. You call this a king? A coward, I cry. The offspring of Uther, an ugly surprise. Did that brave man's blood get bought by another? At this insult, one of the knights stood up. It was Gawain, Arthur's nephew. These hateful words I refuse to hear. You insult King Arthur and sweet Guinevere. But a knight can never say no to a fight. If another knight offers, in that you are right. My name is Gawain, the weakest man here and yet I will meet your axe without fear. I agree to your deal. The terms are clear. The green knight smiled and nodded and took out a huge axe. It was as tall as he was with a blade like a mirror. The other knights rushed forward to give Gawain advice and wish him luck. Gawain ignored them and walked up to King Arthur and Guinevere. The queen spoke first. I give you my blessing, my dear sweet Gawain. When this deal is done, there'll be fame on your name. She kissed his forehead. Next, Arthur blessed him with his sword. Go strong and true as a man of the table. I'm certain you'll win, for no one is able to suffer a blow to the neck and survive. Then Arthur leant forward and whispered in Gawain's ear. And yet I fear that I smell some magic. If magic's involved then the end could be tragic. So be on your guard and take our regards. And show that green monster just who you are. Gawain nodded and went to face the knight. The green knight smiled evilly and handed over the axe. Now that he was stood before him Gawain realized just how huge this man really was. Before I attack you, please let me know. If you live through this blow, where should I go? Don't worry and wonder to where you must walk. Just cut me with courage and then I will talk. The green knight knelt on the floor and presented his neck. 
Gawain held the axe steady and then swung with all his strength. The axe cut cleanly through the man's neck sending his head to the floor. A fountain of blood poured out of him. Nobody cheered and Guinevere went as pale as snow. But then to even greater surprise the man stood up. The body of the green knight without its head continued to move. The man got to his feet and picked up his head by the hair holding it up to show everyone. Men cried out in horror. The cold eyes of the knight stared at Guinevere and the queen fainted. And then the head began to speak. So you see I can speak. I still am alive. That little boy's blow was barely a scratch. A chivalrous man should choose to chase me. To the green chapel. That's where I will wait. In a year and a day to deliver your fate. And the green knight climbed onto his horse and rode out of the castle leaving a huge pool of blood on the floor and a heavy silence in the air. In a year and a day Gawain would have to go to the green chapel and the green knight would return his blow. Part 2 It did not take the knights of the round table long to return to their celebrations. Camelot was a place of joy and peace and the knights never took anything too seriously. But Gawain was sure that he saw some worry on Arthur's forehead and he saw many words whispered between the king and his wife. Guinevere, for her part, was convinced of Gawain's success and told him not to worry. And so the year passed. Cruel winter grew into spring and spring rains dried into warm summer. The leaves burned and danced announcing autumn and finally winter came once more like a child returning home as an adult. One day as Christmas time was approaching Arthur took Gawain aside. I worry Gawain of your upcoming battle. For nobody's heard of this place the Green Chapel. I know you agreed to the terms of the deal. But I worry about you. The danger is real. Gawain smiled and replied. My dear Uncle Arthur your words warm my heart. To have your regards on this difficult path. But I cut off his head that greenest of nights. To avoid the same would just not be right. And so one winter morning Gawain went to Mass, made his final prayers in Camelot and got ready to leave. He had a wonderful suit of armor and a shield that was decorated with a pentagram, a star with five points. The five points of the pentagram represented the five qualities a chivalrous knight must have friendship, generosity, chastity, courtesy and holiness. This shield reminded Gawain of his duty and made him think of the challenges he would face. So Gawain left the round table and wandered through England. He went to the farthest of places, killing the monsters that lived there and asking the people if they had heard of the Green Chapel. But he found only rumors and so his path seemed to stretch on forever. At night he slept on the cold, hard ground with only his shield and his armor to keep him warm. At first Gawain traveled to the southwest in the direction of Tintagel, the castle where Arthur had been born. When he told people where he'd come from he heard many stories about the castle. Gorlois was the previous lord of Tintagel and Igraine's first husband. The usual story was that Uther defeated Gorlois in battle and found Igraine crying for her husband. The lady was so beautiful that Uther's heart was touched and he fell in love with her. She fell in love with Uther but she never quite got over her first husband's death. But one night an old man who lived alone on a windy hill told Gawain a different story. I tell you boy that story's a lie. Igraine met with Uther before her man died. The king was impatient he hated the siege. He needed to bring Gorlois to his knees. So he ordered a potion with parts of Gorlois. 
mixed into the liquid that magical jar. He drank it and changed, his face disappeared. He had Gorloi's body, his hands and his beard. He entered the castle and found the Lord's wife. He entered her, too, and filled her with life. Igraine didn't know that the man was disguised. But when she found out, she wanted to die. And yet it was over, the battle was won. Gorlois was defeated, the new king had come. Gawain was so terrified by this story that he ran away, and he slept little that night. He could not believe that Uther the Great had done something so horrible that Arthur and Morgan were born from such horrors. He tried to forget about it and refused to hear further stories about Tintagel. The rumors of the Green Chapel pushed Gawain to head north. But after months of traveling he began to grow desperate. One night he prayed that he might find a chapel in the morning where he could go to Mass and pray to God. The next day he rode out of the forest to see a castle on a hill. It was beautiful, with tall wooden walls and a thick barrier protecting it. It was surrounded by forests and it was surely the finest castle a knight could ask for. Gawain kissed his helmet and thanked God for his blessing and then rode towards the castle. He reached the gate and called out to the watchman. Good sir, I have traveled all over the land. And now I have found this castle most grand. I'm looking to pass the cold winter weeks. In comfort and warmth to redden my cheeks. Would it be all right if you talk to your lord? and asked him to offer a night room and board? The watchman replied, Certainly, sir. I'll seek him and ask. The guy loves his guests. He'll be glad to greet you. A few minutes later the gate opened and Gawain rode inside. There he found the lord a tall, well-dressed man with a long, red beard. I greet you, my guest, the honor is great. This gentleman's got to be the knight, Gawain. That shield for sure shows Camelot's chivalry. That armor is rather familiar, too. You've crossed the whole country, come to my castle. We're happy to have you. We hope you'll be healthy. Within our walls. We welcome you gladly. When the rest of the castle found out it was Gawain who visited them, they all came to greet him. They dressed him in fine clothes and gave him finer food. Then, when Gawain was warm and his stomach full, the Lord took him to Mass. There he met the lady of the castle. She was just as beautiful as the Lord was welcoming, and she had long red hair that matched her husband's beard. The Lord and I've learned the legends of Camelot. I'm thrilled to think of the time we'll spend speaking. He also met a pair of women. One was quite young and could not look Gawain in the eyes, and the other was a hag so ugly that Gawain could not look at her face. The young lady spoke. When the Lord and Lady are not at leisure. The two of us will take you and treat you to chatter. The hag said nothing but smiled strangely at Gawain. After mass they had dinner and the Lord asked Gawain what had brought him to travel this way. As much as I'd like to stay in your walls. I'm seeking a place to which I've been called. It's called the Green Chapel, a name of great mystery. Nobody I've met seems to know its history. By the first day of New Year I must find the place. Or the night Gawain will fall to disgrace. The Green Chapel. The chance of you choosing my castle. Is odd because actually it's close to that place. On New Year's Day I'll do you a favor. I'll hop on my horse and happily take you. That wasteland is wicked I warn you Gawain. But you are a knight and know your own fate. But Gawain, I want you to grant me a wish. In the morning my men and I move to the forest. 
We're having a hunt and I had an idea. While we run through the rural you will make rest. You'll battle with beauty you'll chatter with chivalry. I can tell you'll take a treasure or two. When I show you the spoils of the chasing and slicing. You'll give me the gift of your gentleman's gains. Trade the fruits of your tricks for the meat from my traps. Do me this deal. I dare you, Gawain. Gawain laughed. It was an interesting idea to trade the spoils of the hunt for a different kind of spoils. And Gawain had met many beautiful women in the castle already. He had to remain chivalrous, of course, but it would be rude to reject his host's request. A deal it is. I cannot wait. I already see the meat on my plate. Gawain happily went to bed, wondering what gains he would make tomorrow. Part 3 The next morning, the lord of the castle rose early, went to mass and then headed out for the hunt. All the animals ran in fear at the sound of the hunters and their dogs, but the lord and his men did not slow down. They chased the female deer, but let the male deer run free as there was a law in the land that prohibited killing male deer at this time of year. Meanwhile, Gawain lay comfortable in bed and woke up in the late hours of the morning. But he did not rise, enjoying the warmth of the fire and the rays of sun shining on his bed after the long, cold months of traveling. The lady of the castle went quietly into the room opening and closing the door without a sound. She stood there by the entrance waiting to see if Gawain would move. Although Gawain was awake he wished to remain in peace and quiet a little longer so he pretended to be asleep. The lady could not believe this and went right up to his bed. With a wicked smile she sat at the end of the bed trapping his legs beneath her. After a few minutes Gawain could see that there was no way out of this. So he pretended to wake up yawning leisurely and then let out a little O oh of surprise when he saw her. The wonderful Gawain awake at last. But you're taken by a trap a terrible trick. This night is now mine. Gawain laughed and spoke. Dear lady you're as funny as you're sweet. But won't you let this knight get to his feet? I have a face to wash and clothes to change. And the servants have my bed to arrange. The lady smiled her wicked smile again. I've told you you're trapped. Your loveliness belongs to the lady as all the doors are locked. The servants are sweeping outside. It's solely as here, sweet. So I'll bar you in bed and if my banter's not brilliant. I'll bargain with my body. Your beauty is priceless so to bargain is to cheat. But please my dear let me at least move my feet. But your feet are so fine I refuse to set them free. It's an honor dear lady to have you flatter me. But you're the one with silken hands. Oh, how I'd love to see you stand. Their banter continued in this way for quite a while. But the lady refused to leave Gawain. Can it be that a boy with a background in Camelot is really so rude a rider of lies? You say you are chivalrous, you shine like the sun. But if you were kind, you would call for a kiss. Is that not what knights are known for? You've trapped me again, your attacks never miss. So please give this sunshiny night just one kiss. The lady smiled triumphantly and kissed Gawain's forehead before finally letting him go. Gawain got up, washed and got dressed. Then he went to mass and spent the rest of the day with the young lady and the hag. The young lady was eager to please and made very good conversation, but the old hag still said nothing. That evening the lord came home with his spoils, a pile of dead deer. So you see, Sir Gawain, I've struggled and sliced. 
the deal will be done, these are your dear. And what have you won for me? Gawain took the Lord by the head and kissed him. A sunny surprise. I'm sick with excitement. Tell me the tale of taking this kiss. Ah, but my Lord, those were not the terms of our game. I agreed to exchange gifts, not to tell you from where they came. The Lord laughed. You are wise, Gawain, and I wish you well tomorrow. I'll hunt with my heart. The spoils, I hope, will be as handsome as today's. So the house went to dinner, and Gawain ate and drank with the lord and the lady until he was full of food and joy and could sleep easy. The next day the lord went once again to mass and then off to the hunt. This time they rode for quite a while without finding anything, but then suddenly they spotted a wild boar. They chased the boar into the woods and up a hill, firing arrows at it. Several arrows hit the boar, but the animal was so strong that it kept running. Meanwhile, Gawain lay comfortably in bed. Once again, the lady came to visit him, and this time he did not pretend to be asleep, but stayed in bed and waited for her to sit on top of him. Then he wished her good morning. You've forgotten your goodness, the glory of nights. You're supposed to pray and be blessed with kisses. From lovely ladies who long for your love. But I've come in and you haven't requested a kiss. I prayed in the morning and wished for a kiss. But I was afraid my desires would miss. If you had said no and our trust was then broken. It would have been better to never have spoken. But think for a moment your arms are so thick. Your strength is unstoppable. The answer's so simple. Just take me like treasure at least you should try. Of course I could take what I wanted by force. But at the round table we consider that course. I won't lay a hand on you, deal you a threat. I won't steal a gift, ever make you upset. The lady smiled, defeated, and laid a kiss on Gawain's cheek. You've learned of love enough to lead lectures. The strongest shape of chivalry, I'm obsessed with it so. Still I'm stupider than a schoolboy. Won't you share your secrets? You flatter me once again, but I detect a lie. Here you are the teacher much wiser than I. To be around you is an honor to banter and play. When I know as much as you, that'll be a sweet day. The lady smiled, kissed Gawain on the forehead and left. Gawain got up and once again went to mass and spent the day with the young lady and the hag. The young lady mentioned she was born in Tintagel, which reminded Gawain of the awful story he'd heard about Uther the Great using a potion to trick Egraine, the mother of Arthur and Morgan Le Fay. Lady Egraine died when the girl was young, but she had a strong impression of her. She referred to Egraine as the mad lady and the hag who was usually so quiet, told her off and said to speak of her with respect. Egraine had been Gawain's grandmother after all, although this did not seem to be the reason why the old woman was angry. Gawain quickly changed the subject. That evening the lord of the castle came in with the wild boar, which was filled with holes from where arrows had struck it. I pray I've not disappointed by picking this prey. Your spoils are surely sweeter, great Sir Gawain. Gawain kissed the lord on the cheek and then on the head. Well, well. Your wealth grows wider and wider. If you continue on this track, you'll triumph with thousands of treasures. Gawain only smiled and did not reveal where his wealth had come from. The next morning a thick frost hung in the air. The Lord went to Mass and rode out with his men. But the cold slowed them down and all the animals they found ran away. Finally they spotted a fox and chased after it. 
The creature was fast and they rode for a long time, chasing the animal through trees and bushes. Meanwhile Gawain lay in bed, but he did not sleep peacefully. He was having a nightmare about the green knight. When the lady came in to wake him, she saw him turning in his bed an expression of worry on his face. The lady could not bear to see him in such a state, so she took his face and kissed him on the lips to free him from his nightmare. Oh, what a pleasant surprise to awake to you. Your jewels are brilliant and your eyes are too. You shine like the sun and chase away the dark. And still on my lips I feel your warm mark. They bantered in their usual way, but with the emotions of the nightmare and the warmth of the lady's kiss, Gawain struggled to remain chivalrous. Yet he did not want to betray the lord who had been so good to him. The lady seemed to be aware of this and teased him more than usual. I find I'm full of fear that you feel for another. You've lain with a lover, a lucky young lady. Do I deceive myself? Or is it so? If you lack a lover then let yourself go. Make love to this lonely lady who longs for Gawain. You're the schoolmaster of sex so don't feel ashamed. If you were alone I would take you right now. But I've love for the Lord and I've made knightly vows. Then I'll bargain a bit, make you bring me a gift. As a friend I feel you owe me a favor of lips. So Gawain kissed the lady's hand in friendship. I'm not satisfied still, want more soup for my supper. In not long you'll be leaving. I'll have little to remind me. Of the time that ticked away between us. A token. Of your feelings affection would be fire for the frosty days. I'm afraid, my dear lady, I brought nothing of worth. When I traveled from Camelot across the hard earth. No beautiful token, no wonderful jewels. If only I'd known. I feel such a fool. Let the girl be the giver, then I'll grant you a gift. Take this ring as you ride, it's richer than a rose. A ring so fine could never be mine. It's more than I ever deserve. Too beautiful? Bah! Take my belt, you big boy. It's sewn with green silk, it shines in the sun. If it has such a shine, then the belt is too fine. I assure you, I'll remember you, token or not. It shines with a secret, a special surprise. That old hag in the hall had her hands on it here. When the master had made it, she moved her mouth and magic came out. She blessed the belt, put in a bonus. When you wear it you'll be well, whatever weapon attacks you. This piece will protect you, I pray you accept it. Gawain remembered his nightmare about the green knight and he knew that he needed the belt. So he let the lady remove it and give it to him. Just one wish I have when you wear this piece of my wardrobe. My husband must not hear, it's a secret from him. I shall not speak a word of it. I'll hide the belt beneath my kit. The lady gave Gawain one last kiss on the forehead and said goodbye. Gawain got up and dressed, hiding the belt beneath his clothes as he had promised. Then he went to Mass and confessed his sins to the priest. As he sat with the young lady and the old hag afterwards he felt like he had met the hag already some time before he came to the castle. But he could not remember where and decided the stress of his nightmare must have made his thinking strange. When the Lord returned that evening Gawain immediately went to him. He kissed him on the lips, the hand and the forehead. My debt is paid, our bargain made. Those were the spoils I won today. The Lord was surprised. Strong spoils you've shown me. I can't do the same. The only thing we found today was this fast little fox. 
Still I thank you, good friend, for what you have given. I'm ready to go, my sins are forgiven. The green chapel awaits. I previously promised I'd guide you to the green. But tomorrow, my man, I've matters to manage. So my servant, the surest, will steer you to safety. Though the chapel is terrible and there none are safe. Gawain thanked the Lord and went to say goodbye to all the people of his castle. As he spoke to the young lady she cried. When he said goodbye to the old hag she hugged him which surprised him. She felt his side and her hand passed over the belt which the lady had given him. The old hag smiled at him and it made him feel sick. Gawain's feet did not jump with joy as he headed to bed as they had done the past few nights. He knew no sweet banter or gifts from the Lord awaited him in the morning. No, now he was finally to face the green knight and most likely his death. Part 4 It snowed in the night and Gawain could not sleep. The knight looked out the window watching the snow fall like jewels. It reminded him of the lady's belt which she said would protect him from the green knight. But could anything stop that monster? In the morning Gawain dressed in his armor, hiding the lady's belt beneath, and kissed the pentagram on his shield for luck. He went to Mass, said his last prayers, and headed outside while it was still early. The Lord's servant accompanied him and they rode through the snow which still fell gently. They passed through a dark forest until finally they came to a tall hill. Then the servant turned to him. Advice you won't be wanting, will you? But take this tip, throw it if you think it tactless. The green knight will knife you to nothing. No deer could dodge him, his danger's undoubtable. No boar could beat him, that bargain's broken. No fox could fool him, that fellow's fearless. Even Uther would be unable to attack that devil's offspring. Run away, Sir Gawain, and wish you'd never made war with him. Gawain shook his head. Your words are kind, you speak them with tact. But I could not permit such a cowardly act. I'll go to my death if that is my fate. I've lived a long life. The spoils were great. So the servant showed Gawain the path he must follow, and the knight rode down into the valley. He followed the path which seemed to lead nowhere until he saw a great green hill in the distance, by a wild river. As he came closer he saw that there was a cave inside the hill. When he looked inside he knew that this was the green chapel. The cave was small and had a horrible darkness to it. This place is a chapel but not to a god. If I didn't know him I'd think it were odd. But prayers in this room are made out to the devil. The green knight's evil is on another level. As he finished speaking he heard the sound outside of a horse coming near. Then there was a great cry which sounded like the earth was tearing itself in two. Gawain went outside and saw the green knight standing on the other side of the field, carrying his huge axe. Well, well, Sir Gawain did not waver in his words. You've come to the chapel, you've chosen to be killed. Unless you can live through a lick of my lady. The knight touched his axe and laughed. Gawain felt sick. Let's not delay or waver this late. I've confessed all my sins and prepared for this fate. I give my neck and await my destruction. I've followed each one of your wicked instructions. Gawain got to his knees, took off his helmet and revealed his neck. The green knight came over and held the axe in the air. Then, with the strength of the devil himself, he swung the axe down. Just before the axe touched Gawain's neck, he flinched, and the knight stopped the blow before it landed. This fellow has flinched, he's filled with fear. The instructions were simple, but you struggle to be still. 
Apologies, Green Knight, I couldn't control it. I held on to bravery but cowardice stole it. So swing once again to make up for the flinch. I won't move my body down to the last inch. So the Green Knight raised the axe again and swung it down. This time, Gawain did not flinch, but still the knight stopped at the last moment. Gawain grew angry. What games are you playing? Oh, why did you stop? Forget your performance and let the axe drop. The knight did not say anything, only grunted and raised his axe another time. This time, when he brought it down, it did strike Gawain, but the swing was poor. The axe did not strike directly but instead struck to the side. It nicked Gawain's neck making a deep, bloody cut but leaving the man alive. Immediately Gawain jumped up and put his helmet back on. I've taken your blow, the bargain is past. My death did not come but I did as you asked. So now I go free with a nick on my neck. I'm sorry, Green Knight, your revenge is wrecked. The Green Knight chuckled. There was something familiar about his voice. Then, as if he had taken a mask off, his face changed. Gawain gasped. I nicked your neck, but it's not a mistake. You recognize me, right? You arrived to me riding. Lord Bertilax before you, Bertilac a hot dessert. You lived on my land, laughed with my lady. The swings I just swung each stand for. The gifts that I gave you, and the gifts that I gained. At the first you flinched, a feature of fear. You love to be alive like lords love their ladies. But I couldn't quite kill you as you gave me that kiss. The second was the same I swung but I stopped. You broke not the bargain, my blow would not beat you. The third time you tricked me, you told me a lie. You borrowed a belt, bound it to your body. But it stayed a secret, you should have supplied it. So I struck to the side to show that you struggled. You survived, that's a victory, but you threatened your vows. I wanted my wife to make wild Sir Gawain to show all his sins to send him to shame, to see if there's chivalry in Camelot's name. Gawain could not believe it. He pulled off his armor and threw the belt on the ground. I thank you for saving me though I was wicked. I threatened my vows you're right, I admit it. I throw off this belt as I count up my sins. It seems though I lived the hot desert winds. Your sins have been sliced like a sword through a snake. That mark on your neck will memories make. This mark is to punish me, but I need to be clean. The belt will remind me what I've learned on this green. So I'll wear it forever to show where I've been. But tell me, dear knight, how did you survive? When I cut off your head, how did you not die? The story is strange. It starts with the sister of Arthur, Miss Morgan Le Fay, who knows magic. She came to the castle looking cold and decrepit. She hid herself as a hag, you know who. Like a dog I fear death, so she did me a deal. I'll make you immortal and you'll make a mockery of the court of King Arthur. We'll kill all their chivalry. Good Guinevere will gasp and go to her grave. The chivalry will be shaken, the sham will be shown. Gawain was confused. I understand why you would choose immortality. But what is confusing is Morgan's morality. What does she gain from bringing Arthur to shame? The man is brother, their blood is the same. But at the word blood, Gawain realized something. Morgan's magic hadn't come from nowhere. It had come from her father who had sired her with a magic potion in his blood. That meant the awful story Gawain had heard was true. Uther had taken a grain before her husband Gorlois had died. 
he had broken his vows. Understanding is spelt in that stare on your face. Yes, Uther the Great took a grain as Lord Gorlois. The noblest of knights can be knocked down to nothing. By the simplest of sins, desire for sex. But I'd heard of the holiness in the halls of Camelot. Did not like to believe that the lords are all liars. I took part in the plan that Le Fay had proposed. But I said, if the swordsmen are chivalrous, if the knights are noble if the holiness holds, then I'll stop my swing and save him, the brave one who brings me his body and bends it. Now I see that the chivalry's stronger than in stories. It burns not in blood is not brought out in birth. But in tact and good acts you tell me your worth. I thank you, good fellow. You've made Le Fay a fool. I regret my involvement. She made me her tool. It is I who should be thanking you. As you've revealed to me a hidden truth. I'll go home and tell Arthur to ride. To return to his sister's side. To hear her side of the story. To put aside Camelot's glory. To let the scars be healed. To honor the cross on his shield. Goodbye, Green Knight, to Camelot I go. How much you've changed me, I'm not sure you'll ever know. And so Gawain left the Green Chapel and Lord Bertilac returned to his castle. Gawain's journey to Camelot was much faster than his trip there as he knew the way to go. When he saw the walls of the castle rising in the distance his heart was filled with joy. He had longed to return though he hadn't known it. The knights of the round table heard him coming and all ran out to greet him. The wound on his neck had healed into a thick scar and they all demanded to hear the story so Gawain told them, showing them the belt which he still wore beneath his armor. When Gawain told them that he planned to wear the belt forever to remind him of his sins, the other knights said they would all have identical belts made and wear them under their armor as well. The only two who did not look so happy to see Gawain were Arthur and Guinevere. He explained to them everything with Morgan Le Fay and suggested that Arthur go and see his sister. Guinevere spoke before Arthur could answer. That woman is wicked. She wanted to kill me. It is she who should feel guilty. Arthur has nothing to apologize for. But Arthur shook his head. Gawain is right, we must put the past behind us. Or else let the darkness blind us. I am glad to hear my sister is not dead. Although her heart has clearly bled. If Gawain can take an axe to the neck and survive. Then I owe it to myself at least to try. A year and a day later Arthur and Gawain rode out of Camelot towards the castle of Bertilac de Hot Desert. They had told Bertilac and Morgan Le Fay of their coming, but so far they had not heard word from Arthur's sister. This would be the truest test of the king's chivalry, but what is life without trials?